Greetings everyone, I'm Mar. Once again, this is my opinion, as you can tell from the title up there. It's time for another trip back to the golden age of cinema. And since this is October, it will be for horror. This, of course, is a film from Universal's second wave of monster movies from 1943. This is Son of Dracula. Directed by Robert, and forgive me if I mispronounced his last name, C.O.D. Mc, written by Eric Taylor, who also wrote the 43 version of Phantom of the Opera in Black Friday, and of course, starring our favorite monster star of this era, Lon Chaney Jr., as the titular son, and this, of course, Son of Dracula. Now, the reason I say son like that, because his character is never really called the son of Dracula. It's is Count Dracula. So the son is just there for marketing. Because we'd already done Son of Frankenstein. And of course, there was Son of Kong at a different time. And then later on we have films like Son of the Blob, Son of Godzilla. So it's just continuing another horror tradition of having Son of. And plus also differentiate this from the Lugosi film. So people don't expect it to be a straight remake. Even though... It is essentially a remake, just in a more contemporary setting. And Dracula's motive is a little bit different than the norm. I'll explain why in a bit. Now, since I mentioned Shaney already, you got to get this out of the case. Out of all of the monster films he did in this era, this is probably the one where he's the most miscast. I mean, for his range, he does what he can with it. But there are times where he comes off a little wooden. Like the line, announce Count Alucard. Which I'll get to that in a second. And then other things. Body language wise, he's fine. It's just when he actually speaks, he doesn't really have a lot of presence. I'll say this, even though his voice was dubbed over, he had more presence as the monster at the end of Ghost of Frankenstein than he does here. Because at least there, you can tell he's having fun with it. Whether or not he knew his voice was going to be dubbed over or not. But there, he seemed to have more fun. His type of over here definitely works more with Larry Talbot, especially after he finds out what happened to him in The Wolfman and then in the later films. And The Mummy is not really a lot of dialogue, it's more physical performance. Here though, he's really miscast. It seems like he was only cast because of the fact his star was rising at this point. They're like, yeah, we'll throw him in there, especially since he's a Cheney for some marquee value. And even at the time, people that were making this film felt he was miscast. And for the people that don't like the film, both contemporary when the film came out and in retrospect, that seems to be the main criticism. And it is distracting. Now, the plot of the film is it's set in then contemporary New Orleans. A Count Alucard has been invited to town. He's not there with his luggage when he gets there. And, you know, as they're picking it up, one gentleman happens to notice something very interesting about it, and that is Alucard is Dracula spelled backwards. So if you're ever wondering where that little cliche came from, it started with this movie. And the way they show it makes sense with the luggage on the side and the guy looking at him and be like, T R. You alright? Nothing, nothing. Silly idea. Now, he does eventually come out, Dracula. And he is attempting to court one of the daughters of a rich plantation. Now, it's a very subtle one that the characters don't see at first, but we, the audience, see it because we see the scenes behind the scenes. Now, since he was invited, it makes you wondering, okay, what's going on? Was he corresponding with this lady for a long time and then showed up? But, this is where Dracula's plan differs from the traditional one. Traditionally, it's like he wants to find new blood and all that, which, that's a little bit in the background of his plan, but the whole courting thing seems to be his more forefront one, and that's more his long-term plan once he gets set up. So he's acquiring land through a marriage instead of the old-fashioned way, he some money. Instead he's getting the land and the other sister gets all the money when their dad dies. Which the way it's shown, it makes it look like Dracula had a, pl had a hand in the guy's death. Older guy, probably weak heart. Which that seems to be a cliche you don't really see a lot in horror films anymore is the weak old heart thing unless they actually bring it up as a good plot point. The best one I can think of is like in Carpenter's The Thing, how the one character already had the heart issues that were carried on to it, which we all know the big plot twist with that one. But 
and we get back here. The characters pretty quickly figure out, well, quickly considering how the film's length is, but so over the course of a couple days they figure out Dracula. Alucard is Dracula. Dracula is Alucard. Dracula is a vampire! They figure out who he is. They figure out that he has married the one sister and has turned her into one of him, Nosferatu. And that his game is, you know, good source of operation. And, like in the other iterations, the reason he's moved is because he wants fresh blood. And what better place to go for that than New Orleans? And I like the setting there because of the whole the whole otherworldly aspect of New Orleans and its folklore. And it makes me wonder, i got to do some research, if uh, Anne Rice knew of this film when she was doing her interview with the vampire, or if she just was vaguely aware of it in its setting. But it's nice. And of course, this is not the first or only Universal monster movie to be set in a bayou or area. Of course, we had that more with a certain Mummy movie I reviewed last year. Of course, that one, they went a little bit more rural. Mummy's on loose and he's dancing with the devil. No such thing here. Which is one thing I'm like, I don't really believe these guys are Southerners. They don't really have the accent, but maybe they just moved down there when the colonel retired. Maybe they inherited it from distant relatives. Something weird like that. Now, Dracula does get killed in the traditional manner with these films, usually involving sunlight. Now, this is one of the few Universal Monster movies that has a downbeat ending, along with that one mummy movie where the girl does die, even though she does come back in the next one. And in this one, it's that, since we've seen the sister Catherine has already been turned into one of the undead by Dracula, there's not really much they can do for her. If she's already one of the undead, the only true cure we've seen in any of these films is release. And that's what happens. And the sad thing is it's the one that she wanted to marry. Uh, Frank Stanley, played by Robert Page, who ends up doing it. And given this is the 40s and in the era of the code, they can't really show it in any great detail. But I love the implication where he puts his ring on her finger. When the other characters show up, he's, you can tell, very morose outside of his room on the verge of heartbreak. Or his heart is breaking. And they look inside and her coffin's on fire. So the implication is he just set her free. Nice little bit of editing. Well, it ends on a downbeat because she's dead. It's more downbeat, bittersweet, considering that not only did they destroy the monster, while well, it came to the cost of the girl, no more undead will rain havoc on that land. So it's one of those ones that it's a little bit of both. And for that, I think it works with this film. Now, watching this film... I can safely say I see why it does have like a little bit of the mixed reception it did have both when it came out and more recently, even without bringing Cheney's casting into it. And that's because in the beginning, it's not really as good as some of the others. I mean, you all know when I reviewed the Lugosi one a couple of years ago, my thoughts on that one. And it just didn't grab me as well, but given how early it is in the monster cycle, it makes sense. And what really makes that one is a couple of the performances from Arm Dracula and Ar Van Helsing. But overall, I prefer the Spanish one. I reviewed that one a couple years ago, video essay style, if you want to see my thoughts on that one. But this one, in the beginning, I wasn't really drawn in. But as the film got on and we started to get more of what the plot was going on until we got to the end, it started to draw me in a little bit more. Can't say it's going to be one of my favorites, or I'll probably watch it that often, but I did enjoy it for what it was. I mean, the supporting cast give performances you would expect from it. Robert Page, what you would expect from the lover whose beloved is under Dracula's spell. Luis, uh, excuse me if I mispronounce this, Albritton as Catherine, who is the sister that Dracula's going after. She does a pretty good job in her performance, and you can definitely tell there's a difference from when she's still alive to when Dracula has already turned her. Uh, for what little she's there, Evelyn Anchors is Claire. Also does a good job, of course. Another little universal connection there. She was Gwen in The Wolfman. Uh, Frank Craven is Dr. Harry Brewster. He's the one who's figuring stuff out. Then we got Pat Moriarty, if I'm pronouncing it right, as the sheriff. Probably the only real southern type character there. And there's more, but those are just a few. 
I put there because outside of where they go in the plot, a lot of these characters didn't really stand out that much for me. It's more of talk about the performance than for the writing. It's by the notes with this one, which that sadly is where we go with, with this second cycle of Universal Horror Movies. If you want your monster fixes there, if you're looking for more, not really a lot to go with. Uh, you know, with some exceptions. And this one definitely strikes me as one that was made just to cash in on the Dracula marquee and nothing more. And then you throw in Cheney's miscasting, it's like, yeah. It definitely strikes me as a film back in the day that made money, but it's not going to be as memorable than like its predecessors. Like, I could definitely see myself watching the Lugosi Dracula more than this one, but that's because that one, you got Lugosi's presence and you actually got an excellent director. Not saying anything bad about Robert, but apples and oranges there. And if I really want to watch a monster feature that's led by Chaney, I'd probably just put on the Wolfman. I'd say this is worth a watch for Curiosity Steak, especially if you have the Dracula set over there. I didn't watch it via the Dracula set, I watched it actually on Amazon. Which it's that time of year, so we got a lot of these films popping up. Like this one was on Amazon. We got a couple of the other classic ones on Peacock, so they're gonna be popping up everywhere. So I'd say it's just at least worth one curiosity watch. Just like there's another one that I hope to get to before the end of the month, which I probably should review that one first. But out of order should be interesting. Which that one seems to also get a little overlooked, considering it's actually a direct sequel to the original one, of course. Y'all know what I'm talking about. That, that one I actually look forward to watching just because of what, some of the stuff I've heard about. It. Now, here's a couple little bits of trivia I thought were interesting to mention. The coat of arms that's on Alucard's luggage is that of the Austro-Hungarian kingdom of Galicia and Lodo Maria, which nowhere near where he hails from. So probably threw it down there just to throw out the scent. Or whoever did the prop just didn't give a crap. Probably that one. Now, this is one other major thing that this film has going for it. And this is the first of these Dracula films to feature a man into bat transformation on camera. There's no fangs in the vampire, but that's a little note. But unlike later ones, it's not really done in a cartoony one. You can tell it's done through animation. But the way they do it makes it seem like they were trying to be respectful of the tone of the film they were going for and not make it too cartoony. And in that regard, I think it works and it holds up pretty well. We also get to see him turning from mist and all that, turning back into mist. Uh, the effects with how they look are a little dated considering it's the 40s, but for the era and how they do it, I think they did it pretty well. So for, the film has that going for it, so it's a little nice. And not just going with implication like in the classic one, but... And one of those things, sometimes the of the mind is better, but it's nice to have seen the effort that went into that a little bit. But overall, like I said, a fun film, but not one I see myself revisiting all too often. Like I said, if I got my monster fix, I got b better films that I'd rather watch from this catalog. But if you are marathoning your way through them, whether you're doing it by monster or in chronological, you definitely should watch it just to say, hey, I've seen it. And that's really all I have to say on this one. So next time you see me talking about Universal Monsters, it should be on the other follow-up to Lugosi's film. Till then, everybody.